Pro-Life Talk. Real world answers. This is Life Report. Welcome to Life Report. I'm your host, Josh Brom, and we are back with my good friend, Jojo Ruba, who's the Executive Director at Faith Beyond Belief. Jojo, thanks for, for uh, coming back with us this week. Absolutely. Okay, let's get right into it. Uh, what, uh, b- before we begin, can you just tell us a little bit about Faith Beyond Belief? I know this is a new organization that you recently started, uh, and that must matter a lot to you personally. So just help us understand a little bit about what is Faith Beyond Belief and why we should go to faithbeyondbelief.ca. Well, you know, I really loved and learned pro life work exclusively full time, usually uh, pro life apologetics. And I did that for almost a dozen years. And, and I still do that as part of my job. But uh, one of the key things I've discovered as I spoke to churches and Christian schools and youth groups is that there's a whole bunch of people who just don't think Christianly about anything at all, which is why they're not active pro lifers. And so as we built up the pro-life group that I was with and just saw the successes that were there, we grew from three people to 20 people uh, and a lot of them young people. I, I realized there's, a, there's room to go a different direction uh, to start where I think most Christians are at, which is they don't actually think Christianly. So when we started this organization, we realized there's a lot of great Christian apologetics organizations that already exist. What, what's needed, though, is someone who's going to help people navigate through all that information. Because the problem with the Internet age is not that information isn't available. You can t- catch it or find it at a touch of your hand on your phone. Uh, the problem is that the information isn't organized in a digestible way. Cool. And so as part of what we're doing at Faith Beyond Belief is providing a- avenues and tools for Christians to access this information that we've organized that we think will be helpful. So one of the key elements of our, what we're doing right now is I teach a Christian worldview course that's 11 sessions long and that uh, starts where a lot of organizations who do worldview courses don't, which is what is a worldview and what is truth? Uh, and we try to do it in a way where we actually don't uh, presume a lot of when we start. So, uh, for example, we don't get to why we trust the Bible until session five in our worldview course, almost halfway through. Why is that? Because there's a lot of stuff we need to explain before we get there. And like Alpha, for example, starts with who is Jesus? Well, we don't get to him until session eight. So there's a lot of things we want to be able to explain. And, and that's because of our, the presuppositions our culture has. So that, I think that's how what makes us different. Uh, one of the other things that I think is is different for us is we've really taken to heart what I've learned in pro-life apologetics and from Greg Kokel and his book on tactics is that Christians don't have a lot of practice time. You know, and when we did pro-life apologetics, we would always have sessions where we teach people to go through all the pro-abortion arguments, to go all through all the the things that we could hear while we're doing pro-life protests or out campus outreaches. But for Christians, we don't really do that. Yeah. The sort of the evangelism training is often one that's molded to to get a, someone to say a sinner's prayer or to become a Christian. But uh, it, it reminds me of a situation I was actually at a pro-life display in Florida. And I was talking to this young lady who was holding a sign that said fetuses don't have hands. And that caught my attention because that's obviously incorrect. And I started chatting with her and we actually had a very cordial uh, presentation or, or talk. She was very nice. She was actually quite Um, approachable. And then then I said, I pointed to her sign. I said, you know, I noticed your sign. Can I just show you this biology textbook that I have? And it's not, you know, it's not a pro-life textbook. And she said, sure. So I went to go get it and brought it back to her. By the time I got back to her, I realized she was talking to two young guys who were going through the four spiritual laws. And Uh. for those of you not know what those are, uh, they're, they're an approach to evangelism where you talk, ask direct questions about God. And, and But this is how the conversation went. They said, do you believe in Jesus? And she agreed. Yeah, she said, I do. But uh, not the Jesus who condemns sin and who talks about hell. And the young men were like, do you believe the Bible? And she's like, absolutely. But not the parts that were added later or changed where people were condemned and judged. And by the end of it, the young men were so frustrated, they walked away and I wanted to talk to them and not her. But uh, I finished talking to her and by the time I finished talking to her, they had walked away. And, And I think that conversation really crystallized for me where we're at as the church. No wonder we can't even talk about abortion. We can't even talk about our own faith. So one of the things we want to be able to do, and we've been doing that in our sessions, is create practice sessions for our churches where we'd go through and show YouTube videos or or conversations of of people who are not Christians, including on the topic of abortion, and to make sure that they have a a chance to 
um, realize it can say something effective in everyday conversations. It reminds me of when I took jujitsu in university and we learned how to fall hundreds and hundreds of times. And uh, my instructor said, well, really, you're trying to build muscle memory so that it becomes automatic. When uh, you all fall by accident, you know what to do. Your body automatically goes into that mode. And, and that's the same thing with this, is that we don't have practice time at all. I've talked to dozens of different churches from many different denominations about all kinds of apologetics issues. And every time I ask them, do you have practice time? And all of them say no. They actually do that. So uh, that's the kind of stuff we want to be able to do in our organization. In so many ways, the stuff I did and learned doing in the pro-life movement as a pro-life activist, I'm bringing into the Christian apologetics field, uh, something that I think uh, is not being done yet uh, because they don't really have many activists yet. So. You talked about the need for pro-life people, at least generally speaking, to be more offensive, to be willing to actually get out there and talk to people. And so I want to ask you about the spectrum um, and, how to, and, and how to be able to tell where someone is on the spectrum, because there's certainly, um, I'm with you, there's people that are way too far on the end of, I never want to offend people, I, never, I, don't, I don't even talk to people because I wouldn't want to offend them. But then, I don't know, I've seen people on the other end of the spectrum that are like way too offensive, I think, it's whenever they talk about abortion or maybe even Christianity, they come, they come across weird at best and really, really off-putting at, at worst. Um, how can people kind of figure out where they are on that spectrum? And maybe if they are too far on the offensive end, how would you kind of advise them to, to be less offensive than they should be? Or how should they know how offensive they should be? That's a great question, Josh. I think uh, that's a balance we all strive to uh, try to meet every day. I, I mean, I, I sometimes fail in that as well. Uh, but it's being aware that that's the case. It's being aware that you have to make sure you um, think th thoughtfully about what you're about to tell someone and why you're you're going to say something to someone. What's your motivation? That's from C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity when he says love is about desiring the very best for someone else. And, and when you think about it that way, I, I think that helps cover a lot for what you're doing. So if I'm talking to someone, say on the internet or someone um, at the university, for example, and they may not be the friendliest person, I always check and to see, well, am I just saying this so I can show off how smart I am? Or am I just saying this to show off how stupid they are? Or am I actually saying this so I can help them? And, and I think that humbles you a lot because that, that changes not only your motivation, but what you think of the person out there because you're saying that person is worth helping right and and I, I think if you put yourself in that position you begin to realize really that's what God did for us uh, he can give us all the signs and wonders he wants and he did in the Old Testament because that's what the people at that time needed that's what we needed uh, to hear from their testimony but he doesn't speak that way in many ways now he, he doesn't have to and in the same way we should be smart enough and wise enough and humble enough to know that we have to present the gospel in the same way to our culture. So if the offense, and this is another uh, line that I like to use, if the offense is about what I am or how I'm acting or what I've, I've said that's offensive in an offensive way, then that's my fault. But if the offense is about the truth that I've said and the fact they don't wanna hear that truth, that isn't my fault, that's their fault, that's their problem. And I think that's one of the key key balancing points for me is I ask myself at the end of that conversation, were they offended if there is an offense that happened because of what I said or because of how I said it? And I think that keeps me in check most of the time. Okay, we're going to spend the rest of this episode interacting with a, with a piece of listener mail that we got. His name is Mark in Hawaii. And this is what he asks. He says, I'm a new listener and was trying to find out exactly what your views are regarding human development and when it at a person comes into being and should be granted human rights. Most importantly, and perhaps most difficult, when do you believe God imbues a body slash soul carrier with a soul in human fetal development? And what are your reasons for that? So why don't we just take a little bit of time, Jojo, and, and, and I'll let you start, and then I'll just fill in if there's anything that's that's at all different for me. Um, what is your basic view? Let's just start uh, uh, when it comes to fetal development and, and when a valuable human begins. Let's start with the biology. Uh, what, what is your view on, on w what the unborn is biologically? Uh, and when, when is there a unique living human organism? 
Well, you know, let me step back. I, I've debated actually several philosophy professors on this issue, and it's actually the favorite issue of philosophy professors. And so when, when I did that, particularly the first one, he actually compared human fetuses to goldfish, and we lovingly uh, have anointed him goldfish boy is, is the way we've called him, uh, just to, to catchphrase all his arguments. And, and his argument was in terms of development, because the fe human fetus is no more developed in terms of its abilities than say a goldfish, it should be treated in the same way. My response to that is we're not talking about the ability of an organism simply independent of the organism. The abilities of an organism exist because of what that organism is. So we need to ask ourselves, well, what is that organism? A human fetus is still a human being. And the reason why its abilities are less than ours is because of the stage of its development. So going back to all the stuff that we can do, whether it's writing Shakespeare or being able to uh, fly a kite or, or go into space. All of those things happen because of the nature of what we are. And the question then becomes, when do we get this human nature? Well, absolutely when our existence begins. And it's biology, not the Bible, that tells us that human life begins at fertilization. Therefore, if we believe in any kind of human rights, it should apply to all human beings. Now, one of the analogies I use in that debate, I think is quite helpful as well, is if we were to go to outer space, and find frozen in cryogenics, what, what, uh, frozen in, in stasis, uh, a, hum, a fetus that looks human, looks exactly like us. In fact, if grown to development, would look exactly like us, except it had sharp pointy ears. In other words, we've discovered Vulcan, a Vulcan fetus. Would we say as scientists or would the society say, oh my gosh, we've discovered goldfish or something akin to goldfish? Would we say we've discovered another intelligent species out there just at a different stage of development? I think, of course, it's the latter. Why is that? Because of the species of that organism, not the stage of its development. So biology clearly tells us human life and anything that reproduces sexually begins life at fertilization. That's when we find our humanness. But I think this is where the personhood debate often gets confused. Biology can't tell us how to value that human life. And I concede right. to my opponents that that doesn't automatically mean we should value human fetuses, but it also doesn't mean we should value Filipino people or black people or brown people. Uh, doesn't say anything like that at all. What science can do is inform us what we are, but we need to turn to metaphysics to tell us how we to value that person. And from a Christian worldview, from a biblical worldview, because for God so loved the world, he only gave his one and only son, it's clear that God loves all human beings, and therefore we should value all human beings, including those who are not born yet. Typically, when I'm talking to someone who's pro-choice who just wants to understand where my views are coming from, I'm going to at least see if I can find common ground on the biology. Uh, so, you know, we, this seems clear that the unborn is, is alive, it's growing, it's reacting to stimuli, it's metabolizing. That's kind of how we usually know if things are, are alive or not. Um, we, it seems clear that it's human. It's got to be human because it came from human parents and it's got a human DNA fingerprint. It seems obvious that it's an organism. Um, because, you know, there's a difference between parts and whole. Scott Klusendorf has talked about that. It's, it's not the same thing as a somatic cell. Um, it's developing itself. It's not being constructed part by part, you know, as, 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 as Richard Stith has, has talked about. So it seems like we, we have a living human organism, and then you're right. That, that, that doesn't mean we should treat it one way. That's just what we have on the biology. And if we can agree on that, then we can talk philosophy. Absolutely. How, how should we treat this person? And and there's a lot of different ways to go about this. I'll summarize what we've been doing lately, um, which isn't, I think, even too far from what Stephanie Gray's team has been using lately. We've been calling it this equal rights argument. We've been saying, uh, we've been kind of saying, like, let's take a second and stop talking about the unborn who are less obvious to our society, and let's talk about a group of, of humans that is really obvious and see what we can learn about them. Let's talk about human adults. Can we agree that human adults should be treated equally? Everybody says yes. And then the, the question is, well, if that's true, doesn't that mean that there's something the same about us? Isn't that, doesn't that mean that there must be a property that we all have in common it's got to be something that we all have equally. It can't be something that comes in degrees like intelligence or size. It's got to be something that we all have equally or it's not going to explain why we should be treated equally. So what is that thing? 
And and at this point, what I've been telling audiences is, is that there's a fork in the road in front of us now. We can go a couple different directions. We can go super philosophical, or we can kind of go a little simplified. The, the super philosophical one, maybe we'll talk about this a little bit later, um, is talking about the inherent natural capacity for a rational nature. That's something that embryos have equally with everybody else. They might not be realizing those capacities to be rational and, and make moral decisions and self-reflect, but they have that inherent natural capacity. But for some people, when you tell them that, that, well, all humans have an inherent natural capacity for rational nature, I think it comes across just like what you were saying earlier today, Jojo, that it looks like we're just showing off our vocabulary and it's not very helpful. For So, so for some people, I'm going to give them an admittedly less precise answer, which is just to say, I think we all have humanness in common. We're all equally human. That's not something that comes in degrees. It's so you either have it or you don't kind of thing. And if humanness is what matters, this is just kind of how we summarize the argument to people. If, if humanness matters, it explains a lot of data about the world around us. It explains why racism is wrong, for example. If racism is wrong because it focuses on a surface difference that doesn't matter morally, and it ignores the thing that we all have in common, which is the thing that matters morally, that we're all equally human. And uh, same thing with sexism. And if humanness is the right answer to this riddle, if you will, and if the unborn are human, and clearly they are, then the unborn should have equal treatment as well. I mean, all of that is great, and, and I've used that as well. I think that's uh, such an important case to make. Uh, I would I would also add this is something I did in my debate, which is you simply ask when someone brings up a trait like rationalism or moral choices, you ask them, well, where do those abilities come from? How did you choose to value them? Because uh, rationality is not some force or being that walks around on two legs on the earth somewhere. And you can point to it and say, there's rationality, therefore we can value it. It can only exist as a function of a human being. And so my point is, if you're going to value something that human beings do, don't you also have to think about valuing the human being that does it? And, and that's where I think that argument can fit into what you're saying in terms of, yeah, the, the, the human fetus does not have the same rational ability as we do, but its rational ability is inherent in its, its uh, identity, its species, its what, in what it is. So everything that my opponents in those debates, when they were bringing these issues up, that they said makes us valuable, uh, they cannot point to those things as independent items that exist be, uh, apart from our humanness. And I think that that kind of explanation helps people realize they're part and parcel of the same thing. You can't divorce the two. So do you, do you get, when you're on the ground, do you get uh, atheists asking you about when souls begin? And do you find yourself having, having to kind of define what that even means to you? Not really. I think maybe Canada is such a secular culture that doesn't really come up very often. What ends up happening is it's sort of used like a red herring. They say, well, we don't know when ensoulment happens. Therefore, you religious people should stop forcing your religious view on ins of ensoulment on the rest of us who disagree with us. Got it. Uh, so that's a very different understanding than what we're talking about here. Yeah. We're not, especially because as a Christian, I believe Christian faith is an objective truth claim, not a subjective one. But what I would point out in terms of those discussions is first of all, regardless of where you believe in soulmate happens, there are certain things that our society has embraced, including human rights. So when we discuss what human rights are, we believe that those things should apply to all human beings, don't we? And, and that's a good question to ask because it sort of delves into whether or not they actually care about the issue of insolment or not. It sounds like your, your listener actually cares about that issue. He's, he's actually asking honestly. So yeah. I would give a different kind of answer to that. And my answer simply is this, look, uh, when we look at the theology of what God's given us in Scripture, He's given us the theology that all humans, male and female, are created in the image of God. And He's imprinted in us something that nothing in all creation has, which is the ability to reflect back His identity. The question then is, when do we get that reflection? When is it that that exists? I would argue it exists when our life exists at the existence of our first being, the first cell that we are. Now, does that mean insolment happens there? I think there's good cases theologically that some historians and historical theologians have made that, of course, that's the only way we can say that we are made in God's image, is so we have a human soul at that point. 
Uh, throughout history, not the theology was the problem with the church. It was the biology. In other words, uh, the theology was always that we should value human life. And at that point in, in, in times past, we didn't know what happened before quickening. But as soon as we knew the baby was moving inside the utero, uh, church fathers, church leaders would say, that's wrong to kill that child. It's obviously a living being. Uh, prior to that, they didn't know. So there was sort of a gray area where the church stood on, on whether or not that was a, an abortion or that was killing anybody. But as soon as microscopes were discovered, science discovered that human life does begin at fertilization when the sperm hits the egg, laws began to change. In fact, Canada's, America's, England's laws all changed around the time when microscopes were discovered. We were able to discover that human life began at that point. So that's telling me that it was biology that informed the, the theology by giving us the actual knowledge. And then at that point, the church fathers all universally said abortion is wrong from the moment of fertilization. So when we look at the argument for insolment or the discussion on insolment, I think there's it could be a very strong case to say it only makes sense that if God made us in our in his image, then he has to ins put our souls at that point when our existence began. Um, Jojo, what, 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 what's your take on, on the, the larger animal rights question? This is being debated a lot right now, and I think this is related to the discussion we're having right now about human value. Um, there's, there's discussion of, of passing laws that may, maybe would give chimps at least bodily autonomy rights. There's a lot of pro-life people that are kind of making fun of the idea of chimps having, you know, any rights at all. What is your kind of just basic, uh, you know, when you talk, uh, when, when that comes up on campus or wherever, uh, what is your general take on that topic? And then I'll give mine. Sounds good. I remember talking to this young lady in North Florida who was a hardcore animal rights activist at our, one of our gap displays that we did there. And she had been so stuck on this issue. She'd been talking to one of our volunteers for about an hour before the volunteer finally gave up and brought her to me to try to talk to her. And, and one of the things I pointed out to her was, in fact, all of us, whether we're animal rights activists or not, make value judgments about other living things. Now, as I breathe in and out, I'm, I'm breathing in, in and out microscopic organisms who I don't believe have the same value as my dog or my a dolphin or my cousin, right? All of these things are obviously value judgments. So I go and, and walk on the grass on the, uh, on the sidewalk. That doesn't mean that uh, I'm an awful person or that I'm walking on some maybe baby chicks or baby elephants. So regardless of what we are, what we do, we always make value judgments about other living things. Even animal rights activists make value judgments by saying animals have more rights than that plants or veg vegetation. So you can't escape that. And secondly, then, well, how do you value or how do you make that determination? What do you do to, to decide which organisms you should value more than others? Why is it that we're concerned about beached whales but not beached worms on the sidewalk? Well, we would look at what the species is, I think. Most people would make decisions based on um, whether or not they have intelligence, whether or not they relate to us in a certain way. Why we, we value them has to do with whether or not they look and act like us, in fact. And so that, that can be subjective, but it's certainly something where we make moral judgments as well. Uh, and this is where I would point out that you can be pro-life against the killing of unborn children who are human and still be pro the lives of chimpanzees and dolphins or whatever. So in elevating those animals to the equal position of the human, it doesn't mean that that gives us an opportunity or uh, excuse to degrade any of the human beings that we also value. And, yeah. and that's why I brought in the, the fact that, you know, human beings are special. We make something uh, sp special about ourselves, even if we're not Christian, because of the nature of who we are. So uh, the fetus, the unborn child is still a valuable human being because of the nature of who she is, even if all those abilities that we choose to value aren't actualized yet. So really, in long and short of it, Josh, there's a, there's a way to simply say, look, it really doesn't matter much in the abortion debate because not human life has value. If you'd like to insist that animals should have the same value as human beings, I'm not going to debate you at that point at this time, because uh, I might agree with you. Uh, Hindus are pro-life and also believe that animals have the same or similar rights as human beings. So that that doesn't mean that uh, the abortion debate is at any all effect, can can ha or has to be at any all affected uh, by a position on that issue. 
Yeah, I, I, I think that's really helpful, Jojo. I've been, I mean, I'm thinking a lot about this issue. I'm, I think I'm still kind of in process and thinking about it, but uh, just the, the thumbnail sketch of where I am uh, for any listeners that are uh, interest, interested is that um, I, as a Christian, I, I think I've got a rational reason for believing that humans are more valuable than other animals. Um, so, like, I, I, I just don't freak out if I step on a cockroach. I actually step on cockroaches at will when they're in my studio. Uh, but I also <laughs> don't think I, 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 I don't think that pro-life people should be making fun of certain animal rights activists as much as I see happening right now. I think there are certain animals like whales and dolphins and chimps and gorillas, um, and, and there's probably a few other species in that in that group. But animals like that that are kind of it's kind of hard to know exactly what's going on there. How intelligent are they? How self-aware are they? Um, and, and, and how much does it matter that they seem to work in family groups and have, you know, certain social interactions that other animals don't have? But I, I, I'm, I'm concerned that sometimes we come across as, wow, that just doesn't matter at all. And I think maybe it does. And seeing movie documentaries like The Cove and Blackfish um, make me think, you know, maybe we shouldn't kill whales. <laughs> Uh, even if <laughs> whales aren't as valuable as humans, uh, I'm I'm probably would be fine if in the end we just decided we weren't going to have those animals in captivity. So there's a lot more that can be said about that, but that's a little bit of where where I'm processing right now. I don't know. I don't know if I necessarily disagree. I think that's probably right. I'm I'm actually a little bothered. For example, that Japan just recently announced they're continuing their annual dolphin hunt. Yeah, right? that that seems a little unnecessary to me because. There's no need for that. I'm actually reading Deuteronomy right now, and one of the things that they use was porpoise skins or dolphin skins to make the temple uh, that they were using. Mm. And you know that, that that tells me though that that's something that's special that you don't use very often. Maybe they would find those yeah. dolphins bleached, and that's how they would find the skins. But but it also reminds me too that as as Christians, from a Christian worldview, we are stewards of the earth, which means we're not people who are who enslave everything, but that God's entrusted it to us to take care of. So from a biblical worldview, I think it can be very defensible to say we shouldn't kill certain kinds of animals. Because value that we can see in them. We can decide that for ourselves, how valuable they are, because God's given us that right to do that. So, um, you know, but in terms of the abortion debate, all I'm saying is it's not, it's not that it's not important. It's, it's mean, it simply means it doesn't necessarily even have to apply because it's a different kind of species that we're talking about, different kind of set of values that we'd be using to evaluate uh, who or what we value at that point. Jojo Ruba is the executive director of Faith Beyond Belief. You can check out their website and should check out their website at faithbeyondbelief.ca. Jojo, this has been a blast. Thanks so much for taking time with us today. Anytime, Josh. I'm glad we finally did it. That's our show. Uh, If you want to have a good impact on any conversation, you can do it if you remember to ask good questions, listen to understand, and find genuine common ground when possible. That's our show. Now, go talk to someone. You've been watching Life Report. Pro-Life Talk, Real World Answers. Life Report is produced by Right to Life of Central California. Visit their website at fresnoprolife.org.